Amen. In writing to the Corinthian believers, the Apostle Paul uses this salutation of grace and peace as he is wont to do. In verse 2 he says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 3 he switches to mercies and comfort. And Paul tells us a little bit about his experience in verse 8. Look there. He said, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, and so much that we despaired even of life. Paul says, number one, they were pressed out of measure. This means literally speaking of a burden that is so heavy that it presses down and pushes you to the earth. I've often thought when I read that pressed out of measure of a, 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 a roll of dough, you know, a ball of dough, and you take that cookie cutter and you press it down until it spreads out. That's what he's talking about here. Pressed out of measure, beyond ourselves. He says above strength, beyond the strength of their human bodies, beyond the strength of their human resolve. They'd come to a place where they, were, they couldn't carry on by themselves. Number three, he said, we despaired even of life. The word that's used there is ekap oral amahi. It means exasperated. They were utterly at a loss. They were despondent. They'd come to a place where they were completely exasperated. That's the experience of the Apostle Paul. In chapter four, he says that they were troubled on every side. He says they were perplexed. They were persecuted, and they were cast down. You wonder what would give the Apostle Paul the wherewithal to carry on, wouldn't you? I see three things that Paul had that we need to have in order to carry on. And not carry on only, but to make strides forward and to accomplish victories. The first thing we want to look at is, number one, Paul had a cause... Turn with me to chapter 4, verse 16, if you would, of 2 Corinthians. Paul had a cause. Verse 16, Paul says, For which cause we faint not? Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul, why don't you quit? Paul, why don't you give up? Paul, why don't you get discouraged? He said, because I have a cause. There is a cause. Do you remember what David said when he went down there to the battle and he saw Goliath and they made fun of him, his brothers, and he said, is there not a cause? David had a cause. The apostle Paul had a cause. And Paul says here there was a cause that gave them the purpose and the power to carry on and not to faint. And that cause was the cause of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul realized there was something bigger than himself. Something more important than himself. And something worth living for and even dying for besides himself. We live in the time of ourselves, don't we? Everything's about us. Paul said, no, everything's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about others. Every man has a cause. Every man has a cause. Every woman has a cause. For some, it's the environment. For others, it's the animal kingdom. For still others, it's the eradication of some condition or the eradication of some disease. That's their cause. It's what keeps them going. What gets them up in the morning. It's what keeps them up at night. It's what gives them that strength to carry on. They have a cause. Some people find a cause in education or in medicine or in technology or religion or what have you. Some people find their cause in their family or even in themselves. Some people, their whole cause in life is themselves. It's all about me. Some people have as their cause their own advancement and material wealth. There are a lot of causes in this world. Paul had a cause prior to his conversion to Christ. You know what that cause was? Judaism. And part of the cause of Paul before he got saved was the eradication of Christianity. That was his cause. Let's go round those Christians up and let's haul them off to jail and let's stone them to death and let's silence them once and for all. That was Paul's cause. And Paul had, you know, he had the credentials. 
In Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, it says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul had credentials, didn't he, before he got saved. He had a cause before he got saved. However, he found a cause that was greater. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul's saying, you know, you know all that stuff that I used to boast in, you know all that stuff I was proud of, you know all that stuff I walked around with my chest all puffed up and my suspenders out to here? He said, all that stuff's garbage, it's dung, compared to Jesus. He said, the cause I used to have is empty and worthless compared to Jesus Christ. He said, to have him is worth losing everything. Wow, Paul got it, didn't he? He got a good dose. Paul had a burning cause within his bosom that transcended all else. Transcended his nationality, his religion, his occupation. Transcended his education, his standing in the community or the synagogue. It transcended his heritage. We hear a lot about nationality and heritages and so forth today. That's sometimes that's people's cause, isn't it? Paul had a cause worth dying for. He said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to go. Huh? I mean, don't get nervous. I'm not going to go kill myself because that wouldn't please the Lord and I'm too scared to do it anyway. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I'd like to go home. There's nothing in this world anymore. I really don't care to do anything, go anywhere, have anything, see anything, hear anything. I, I really don't care. The only reason I'm here is for Jesus to have a ministry and, you know, I want, to, I want my wife to go before I do. Because I don't want to leave her here all by herself. Other than that, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing worth staying here, friends, except the gospel ministry. That's how Paul said, you know what, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And you know what, he wanted to leave this old world and go be with Christ, but he had a cause. And in verse 24, he says, nevertheless, what did he say? To live is Christ, to die is gain. I want to go home and be with Jesus, he said. But nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, he said. Well, said, I got a ministry here. I can't leave. I can't go. I got something to do. God has me here for a reason, Paul said. And that reason, he says to the Philippians, is you. Now, you may not have been called to be an apostle or a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist or a missionary, but you're called to be a Christian. You're called to be a soldier. You're called to be a servant. You're called to be a soul winner. You're called to be a faithful steward. That's your calling as a born-again believer. So what are you going to do, dear believer, when you get perplexed and you're persecuted and you get cast down and you're pressed out of measure, above strength, or even despairing of life? How are you going to rise above all of that? You need to have a cause that's greater than yourself. Amen. You need to have a purpose for living that's greater than yourself. It's called the cause of Christ. That's how Paul did it. He had a cause. Number one, Paul had a cause. But number two, it says here that Paul saw a crown. He saw a crown. Look at, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Look what he says. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. First of all, Paul calls all the things we just looked at, all that stuff I just said he went through, he called it light affliction, pressed above measure, uh, pressed beyond measure, above strength, persecuted, all that. Light affliction, Paul says, nothing. But I want to show you something else. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 because we're going to have to add this to the list. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and look at verse 24. 
And Paul goes on to say, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, say one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. All, that's all what Paul calls light affliction. When was the last time you received 39 stripes? When was the last time you were beaten with rods or stoned? My affliction would have to be considered ultralight. You know what I mean? Ultralight. Matter of fact, if I was standing next to Paul, mine wouldn't even get on the scale. My, mine wouldn't, my reflection wouldn't even register standing next to the Apostle Paul. I'd be in the minus column. And yet, we whine. And, hey, don't we? Sure we do. We whine. We complain. Paul said it's just light affliction. Hi, Paul, how can you do that? How can you see it as light affliction? He said, because I have a cause that's greater than myself. And he says, I see a crown. Look at the verse. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. He said it's for a moment. I bet you when they had him tied up to a pole and they were beating him with that cat of nine tails and, and ripping his, his flesh off of his back with 39 stripes, I don't think that felt like a moment. I don't think when they were beating him with rods that it felt like a moment. Or when they were stoning him. Can you imagine being stoned? I mean, people are hurling rocks at you, at your head. I don't think that felt like a moment. But when he looks at it all in, in, in the whole scheme of things, he said it's just for a moment. This life is a moment. It's a vapor. It vanishes away. Doesn't it? Paul said, I, you know what? This life is only a moment, and my afflictions are light, because I've got a cause, and I see a crown. The weight of the eternal glory would fling his afflictions clean off the scale and into oblivion one day. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.18, the next verse. You see, here's where he's looking at the crown. He, he mentions that eternal weight of glory in verse 17, but then he says, while we look, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Friends, if we keep our eyes on the things that are seen, no wonder we're depressed. No wonder we're discouraged. No wonder we feel like quitting. We're looking at the things that can see. We can see, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in this world that you just don't want to see. Paul said, you know what? You can look at that if you want. He said, I'm keeping my eyes on the things I can't see. What's that, Paul? Crown. I see a crown. How do you see that crown, Paul? By faith. Paul was not running for some expendable, temporary, fleeting crown, but for an eternal one. You know, this world is not the end, nor its treasures the measure of a man. This world is a vapor, a moment, a little while. That's all it is. And then it vanishes away. Isaiah 65, 17, listen to this verse. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. Ha! Huh. You know what he's saying? He said, when, he, when we leave here, when he gets rid of, when he makes a new heaven and new earth, we won't even remember this place. You won't remember it existed. It won't even, he said, it won't even come to your mind. But yet we spend, we're, we're so absorbed with it, we're so consumed with it, we, we expend so much energy in it, we're, we live so much for this world, and you're not even going to remember it. Huh. 
all the stuff we're so crazy about, you know, we got to have it and we got to store it and we got to pile it up. God said, you don't even remember it. It won't even come to your mind. It's like the garbage that you take out, you know, uh, uh, put on the corner or on the street and they come and take it away. You don't think about it, do you? You Oh, I'm thinking about my garbage from last week, yeah. (laughs) You never think about your garbage. God said this whole world is just going to be burned up in the incinerator, the holy incinerator of God. You'll never think about it. I think that's pretty awesome. It's going to all disappear. Paul said, keep your eye on that. See? You see, when you are perplexed and persecuted and pressed beyond measure and you're going to need something more than the trinkets of this world, you need to look at that crown. And you need to say, you know what? There's an eternal way to glory coming. That's what I'm living for. That's what I'm running for. That's what I'm hanging in there for. That's what I'm serving for. That's what I'm not going to quit because I see that crown. I've got a cause. I see a crown. And then number three, go back to chapter one. Paul knew a comforter. Paul knew a comforter. 2 Corinthians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Some people try to find comfort in substances, in things, in seclusion. They'll go off somewhere all by themselves, try to find comfort. Hey, you're going to spend all week with yourself. You're not going to get any comfort. They try to find comfort in entertainment or escape or work and a host of sinful activities, trying to numb ourselves and find comfort from this world which we're trying to hold on to for so so hard. Does that make sense? It's like we're holding on to it and saying, I I need to have comfort from it, but I don't want to let go of it. But all the things and people to which we may turn for comfort are fallible and feeble in the end. You remember that man named Job? Remember Job? Job was having some tribulation, right? And again, you you read about Job, and then you look at your situation, and you feel like a worm when you complain about it. I mean, I haven't seen anybody from Grace Calvary sitting on an ash heap somewhere covered with boils, scraping themselves with potsherds. Job said, well, actually, in Job chapter 2, verse 11, it says his friends came to comfort him. You remember them friends? And in Job chapter 16, verse 2, you know what Job calls them? He says, you're miserable comforters. You ever been there? You ever have somebody come to comfort you and you end up comforting them? They come to cheer you up and they start telling you all their problems and you end up cheering them up. Miserable comforters are those comforters that come and tell you why it's all your fault. If you were more like them, if you were more spiritual, if you just loved Jesus more, if you would just this and that and it's all your fault and it's all your sin, that's what his friends came and told him. He said, you're not giving me any comfort here. You're not helping. I feel miserable enough. Amen. David felt like that in Psalm 69, verse 20. David said, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. David said, I just wanted somebody to say, I'm praying for you. I just wanted somebody to say, I know how you feel. I just wanted somebody to say, Hey, Paul, I'm on your corner. He said, but I couldn't find anybody, David said. I couldn't find anybody comfort me. What a sad thing. He looked for him. He couldn't find any. You ever been there? You ever been there? You feel all alone? Nobody knows. Just you. That's why you need a comforter like the one Paul had. He said, I hear the God of all comfort. You hear that? The God of all comfort. Do you know that the Word of God is called comfort or comfort? 
In Psalm 119, verse 50 and verse 52, the Word of God is called our comfort in Romans 15, 4 and in 1 Thessalonians 4, 18. The Word of God, our comfort. When, where did David go to encourage himself? In the Lord. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter in John 14, 6, 18, and 24? Now let's look at our verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I want you to notice the person of comfort. Who is it? It's God himself. The God of all comfort. That's the person of comfort. I want you to notice the power of comfort in verse 3. He's the God of all comfort. How much comfort? All comfort. That means all kinds of comfort. Whatever kind of comfort you need, God is the God of it. He's the source of it. Not only all kinds of comfort, but comfort in all places, about all things, at all times. That's God. Why? Because God's omnipresent and omnipotent. That's the God of all comfort. And Paul said, you know what? That's who I'm trusting in. That's who I go to. I go to the God of all comfort. So we see the person of comfort. That's God himself. The power of comfort. It's all, he said, who comforteth us in all our tribulations. All our tribulations. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, he can comfort you in it. All of your tribulations. Now, that means he's always available. But you know what? Do we sometimes refuse to be comforted? I think we do. We refuse to be comforted. Have you ever, have you ever been out of sorts and someone comes to comfort you and you say, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. You know what you're doing? You're refusing to be comforted. I don't want to talk to you right now. I just want to sulk in my own misery. Leave me alone. Don't try to comfort me. I don't want to be comforted. That's what we do to God. We're in a tribulation. We're perplexed. We're cast down. We're having a problem. And God wants, God wants to reach out with his arms and comfort us. And we're saying, leave me alone. Not now. Come back later. I don't want that. And then you know who we get mad at? We get mad at God. Sometimes we don't accept God's comfort. Do we find some kind of perverse pleasure in being miserable? Depressed? Afraid or worrisome? I think we do. I think we do. That's how sinful we are. We find a perverse pleasure in being miserable. Just let me be here and be miserable. I just want to be miserable for a while. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Hey, why don't you just put matchsticks under my fingernails and light them on fire? Help me out here, would you? Crazy. We thrive on pity and sympathy like an addict does his substance. And when we refuse the comfort of the person and power of God, then we cannot know, number three, the purpose of comfort. You see, there's the person of comfort and there's the power of comfort. God can comfort you. It says so right here. But when we refuse the comfort, then we never know the purpose of comfort. Look at verse 4. Here's the purpose of comfort. Talking about God who comforteth us in all our tribulation. What's the purpose? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Others is the purpose. You think Job ever passed by a guy sitting on an ash heap scratching himself with pot sherds? Think he ever passed by and not without, without saying a word? I doubt it. You think Job had a special tender spot in his heart for people suffering afflictions? I think he did. Why? Because he went through it. See? 
Our comfort is not for ourselves only, but for others whom we will comfort. Remember David said, I looked for a man to comfort me, I couldn't find any. You know what? Then David, you be that man. For the next person. Job said, you guys are miserable counselors. Okay, then Job, you be a good counselor to the next guy. We are comforted of God so that God can comfort us so that we can be available to God to comfort someone else for God. People experience a lot of troubles in this life and sometimes they feel they need a flesh and blood person to talk to. They need a flesh and blood person to counsel up someone who has been there, someone who's experienced that. Someone who can say, I know how you feel and really mean it because it's true. Job's friends, though they may have meant well, did not know how to comfort Job because they had never been in such a spot. And obviously did not know the comfort of God and were therefore unable to comfort Job. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, we're told to comfort one another. How? How can we comfort one another? By the word of God, number one. Because 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, comfort, one, your, comfort yourselves, uh, comfort one another with these words. So you want to comfort somebody, comfort them with the word of God, and then comfort them with the comfort where you yourself have been comforted with from God. Now go back and look at verse 5. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 1. Look what it says. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Don't forget Jesus suffered. Huh? As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. We saw that the Father is the Comforter. We saw that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. We saw that the Word of God is the Comforter. And now we find out that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Comforter. Because the word comfort in this verse and the word consolation are exactly the same word in the Greek, paraklesis. They're interchangeable. That's what the word consolation means, comfort. So here we're finding out that Jesus Christ is the comforter. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God all are to comfort us. Isn't that awesome? So why did, why did you suffer affliction or trouble or persecution or peril? Why are you going through what you're going through? Why are you experiencing what you're experiencing? Why were you pressed beyond measure, above strength, even to desperation of life? Why were you allowed to be cast down and be brought to the point of exasperation? One reason may, may be that God, as someone else, is going to need you. God wants to use you to minister to somebody else. Oh, I know you're not a pastor. I know you're not an evangelist. I know you're not a missionary. But you might be the most important person in someone else's life. Somebody like a Job that's looking for help. Someone like a, a David who's saying, I just want somebody to be a comforter. And you know what? You might be the person God brings along that changes their life. Because you comforted them with the comfort wherewith you've been comforted of God. They're going to need your understanding. They're going to need your pity. They're going to need your experience and your comfort so that they can have your victory. That's exactly what Paul says in verse 6. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, look what he says. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation, paraclesis, comfort. In the enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. Paul's saying, you know why we're being afflicted? You know why we're experiencing this? So that we can comfort you. Because you're going to experience the same thing. And he says, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Paul says, we're experiencing this so that we can experience God. And when we experience God, we can comfort you. We can be a blessing to you. 
you may bring the comfort and encouragement that proves to be the inspiration for someone else. You know what? You need to have a cause. And you need to see a crown. And you need to know the comforter. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. You're here tonight, you're a born again Christian. You're in the family of God by grace through faith and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does this put a fresh perspective on your troubles, on your tribulations, on your experience? Do you see that there may be a purpose far beyond your own experience for which God is preparing you? Are you willing to receive the comfort of God so that you can comfort someone else? Perhaps tonight you're in need of the comforter. He's near. And he'll be found if you seek him. Maybe tonight we need to come before this altar and say, Lord, number one, I need you to comfort me. And then we need to say, number two, Father, I want to be the comforter that you're going to use to help someone else. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved, or maybe you're watching, you know. You're not watching by accident. You're watching because God wanted you to watch. And you might not be saved. The Lord Jesus is the eternal comforter. And by that I mean that because of your sin, you're going to, you're going to one day be ushered into a place called hell upon your death to spend eternity in conscience torment as the just payment for your sin against God. However, the Lord Jesus Christ came to save sinners from that horrible place. By dying in your place and shedding his blood for your sins and being buried in your tomb, and he rose again from the dead with the power and the authority to forgive sins, take away the condemnation, and give eternal life. And he did it all. On the cross he said, It is finished. There's nothing you can add, nothing you can do, except this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All that's left is for you to believe. To believe that you're a sinner and all of sin to come short of the glory of God. To believe that Jesus is the Christ, the only sinner, uh, only, the sinner's only hope. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And you need to call upon him by faith to forgive your sins and save your eternal soul from the lake of fire. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you do that? Why don't you do it? Say, preacher, I need to do that, and I'm ready to do it, and I'll do it right here and right now. Look up at me. And say, preacher, by looking up, you're saying, I want to pray, I want to trust Christ, I see it, I need it, I want it, I'll do it. I'm ready. If you're watching, why don't you bow your head right now and confess your sin to God. Tell him you believe that you're a sinner and that Jesus died for you and rose again from the dead and he's the only one that can save your soul and forgive your sins and ask him to. Trust him as your savior. Ask him to be your savior right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for being that comforter. Forgive us, Father, for refusing your comfort, for resisting the Holy Spirit as he tries to comfort us by not going to the word of God that you've given to be our comfort, by not allowing the God of all comfort and the Lord Jesus Christ to minister to us in our life and in our experience and in our need. We're just so selfish so often. Lord, all along you're trying to comfort us so that we can comfort others with the very comfort we receive from you. But if we don't receive it, we don't have it to give. Help us to understand this. Help us to accept your will for our life so that we can be what you want us to be, the comforters to others in their time of need. I pray you'd bless our invitation. I pray, Father, for anyone watching or listening that needs to be saved, that, Father, they would trust Christ right now and let us know. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn, number 480, Footsteps of Jesus. Maybe you need to come tonight and say, Lord, I need that cause. I, I, I want to make your cause my cause for living. Maybe you need to get a hold of that idea of seeing that crown. Say, I lose sight of the crown. I get my eyes on everything else.
it takes me away, it distracts me, it discourages me. Maybe tonight you'd like to come and say, you know what? I need your comfort, Lord. Or maybe you want to come tonight and say, Lord, I want to be your vessel to comfort others. And I'm going to look at what I go through in life as preparation for that day when I'll be the one that you use to help somebody else. We're going to sing that song. You come now as we sing. All right? On the first. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me, and we see where thy footsteps falling. The Bible says that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You know how? He was here. God was here. And he was human. He experienced many of the things we experience. He knows. What a comforter. He's able because he's God and because he was man. Let's let God use us. You're going to sing that last stanza. If you need to be saved, you come. But if you need to pray, you do that as well. On the last. Then at last when on high he sees us our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus Caleb Stone, would you come up and close us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this Wednesday evening service, and I thank you for the good message we heard this evening, and just help us all to remember, Father, that uh, you're the, uh, the comforter, Father, and that um, you, the comforter has come, Father, and that just help us to, just to keep our focus on the eternal and not on the temporal. And to realize, Father, that this life is but a short, uh, fleeting moment, Father, and, and that eternity is much more important than the things that happen here. And I pray that you just help us to um, uh, use our uh, trials and tribulations to be a comfort to those who are going through the same type of thing that we uh, had victory over, Father. And I pray that you just bless the prayer time to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer time to follow.